With a little, of course, it's a little over a day to the premiere of the Scars of the Revolution. Ahead of that, though, today, you get a chance of hearing from one man. He was the PNDC, Provisional National Defense Council, that was in power from the 31st December coup through to the time that we transitioned into democratic rule in 1992. But for a very brief period, two or three years between 81 and 83, my guest today was the Youth and Sports Secretary, if you like, Minister, if you want to appropriately put it. His name, I'll be telling you after this short break. You welcome back. This is our front. My name is Raymond Aqua. Zaya Yebo is a man of significant relevance to our history. In the year 1981, he was the first youth and sports secretary of the PNDC that actually came into governance after overthrowing the Liman administration in 1981. This man held that position. There's a story told about how we won the 82 cup. And that story is captioned because it was under your uh, control or uh, supervision that we won that particular cup. Zaya Yebo, how are you doing? I'm doing well. You welcome very specially. Thank you. <laughs> Where have you been? Where have you spent most of your life after you went into exile? I spent most of my life in London. Oh, okay. And then I was working for many, I was working for international organizations, which I meant I traveled within Africa. Okay. To places like Gambia, Kenya. Yeah. Yeah. Like so after revolutionary days, you became more or less like an international statesman. Well, man had to survive. <laughs> That's an interesting <laughs> point to know out there. Yeah. But having to go on exile is part of the story you'll be telling us. Yeah. But let's fast forward to the times you got active and interested in, in the Ghanaian political scene and affairs of the state. This should be around the military government of uh, 79? No, I think it was much earlier. Yeah. I, I went to Legon in 1976. Oh, okay. That was a champion's time. That was a champion's time. And at that time, the champion regime was unraveling. Okay. The economic situation was bad. I think Ghana was under sanctions, even though they never admitted it, mm -hmm. because of Achampong's radical economic and social programs. Yeah. So the economic situation was really bad. And then, and, there were, and in those days, apart from the student movement, you had a professional bodies association, which yeah. was very active. So between the student movement and the professional bodies association, there was a decision to do something about the Achampong regime. But the student movement took... We took the lead and we held several demonstrations against the Achampon government. And that was when my interest in politics developed. Mm. And I became a student leader. In those days, you had to be a student leader. So I was, uh, what was I? I was secretary to Akuafu Hall, JC. Oh, I, I see. Yes. And so I took part in all those events. But mm. from that period onwards, we spent almost two years of our university life fighting against the Achampon regime. Mm -hmm. And for some of us, it was not just about the Champion regime. So it took some of us back to the 1966 school because some of us argued then that if the 1966 school had not occurred, then maybe the situation in the country would not have been so bad. Of you, course, believe there are many that. you believe that if, uh, we did, we did. Uh, in Kuma had not been removed, we would have been close to heaven by now. We would have been close to heaven. Of course, some, some people disagreed with us violently. So we used to have those arguments. On the campus. argument has been there was no way we could remove the uh, then and Koma government through democratic means. Well, I, I, well, it depends on why, what, what you define as democracy. As we, a true popular participation and election. Yes, at that time, Nkuma was elected. Don't forget. The uh, yes, was yes. Elected. But there was no way we could remove him through elections. No. Africa was in a different trajectory in those days. The uh -huh. one-party state, which I think was maybe a mistake, the one-party state system made it impossible. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. Serious but that's what the proposed complaint changes. really is yes. about. But, uh, but in spite but of they that, are, they are quest for political participation and aspirations m to be met were extremely limited. They were limited, but uh, I, I believe that the economic conditions, uh, the economic uh, advantages that we had under, under the Nkrumah regime also tended to ameliorate some of the effects of the one-party political system. 
Okay, that, that's interesting. So, economy as against <laughs> yes, that, the impact that, of one party political system. Yeah, that, that argument is still going on. We I, I, I get you. I understand that. Yeah. And when people look at Rwanda uh, now, they make a similar uh, argument yeah. that, uh, I mean, really, what can you put to the cost of bread? Is or it which level of freedom? Matter. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, yes. that argument is still going on. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it, but Ghana is a different country altogether. Mm -hmm. I think there was a time when maybe certain changes were necessary. Okay. For for Ghana to move forward, that did not happen. But I think that you don't think the sixty sixth coup was justified. I don't think so. I'm not one of those who think it was justified. Was, I was there, a young was pioneer, there, so anything. Was there removal? You were a young pioneer. I was a young pioneer. As yeah, a kid, I see. So obviously, anything against the CPP was not in my interest. You, you, you don't have any regrets even up to today of being a young pioneer. Oh, not at all. I think it is the young pioneers that prepared me for what I was later to become. Okay. Because we taught a lot of political, mm. you know. Pan-Africanist, we're basically indoctrinated into Pan-Africanism, into see. socialism and so on. Negative or positive? For me, it was very positive. Even today? Yes. You still believe it today? I still believe it. And from, I believe from that your experience across the world? Yes. From the fact that socialism seemed to have been left with a few countries and it's uh, uh, not so relevant. It was but socialism now. was never implemented in many countries in Africa anyway. Yes. There were very few and mm -hmm. they were mostly these one party. Some of them were one party states. I get you. And they just, they just talked about socialism. They never really... Was the removal the of um, the Buzia government justified? For those of us from the CPP side... Yes. We thought it was justified, even though we couldn't really. At some point, use the same excuse that the NLC had used: yes, sir. corruption. Yeah, that's true. And the fact that in the case of Achampo, he added one thing that said, "Well, as senior army officers, they were not getting the benefits that they should have had." Yeah. So many for those of us from the CPP, we thought it was justified, even though I don't think it was as justified as subsequent ones. Now. When did you become very actively involved in our politics? Was it after you left Nukes or it was still during your... It was during the Nukes period. The National Union of Ghana students. The National Union of Ghana students. We became very active in the anti achampon struggle. Crusade. The struggle against union government. You supported governments. the palace school. We, we, we never really understood what that palace school was about. You do, why? Basically, we wanted a champion and the whole military leadership, at the time leadership out. Yes. The military hierarchy became smart and decided to sacrifice a champion. Mm -hmm. So we thought that was not enough. Mm. So the, the, the struggle against the military regime really continued. Oh, okay. It continued until June 4. Mm -hmm. Well, let's say until May 15 when it was interrupted. Okay. And then June 4 happened. You supported May 15? No, we didn't. We never knew who what Rollins stood for. We were excited that there was going to be change, but I don't think we supported May 15 the way we supported June 4. You, you didn't support May 15? No. We never really understood. Did you, did you know that May 15 was going to happen? No. Some people knew, but no. I, I, well, personally, I don't think that many of us in Legon knew June, May 15 was going to happen. As the it students took front at the time. It took the students front Did you clamor surprise. for something like May 15? No, we wanted change. We wanted but democratic May 15th was, change. Was, oh, okay. Democratic change. All right. We did not see a situation where the military would try to bring about change. So all that we were clamoring for was a handover to a civilian administration. And then Achampo offered us a combination of military and yeah, civilian Unigov. leadership, Unigov, which we turned down. So we're still clamoring for change. Change in the sense that let the SMC go home and let us elect our, our, our Let them literally again. go back to the barracks. barracks. Basically, that's what it was. We saw June May 15 as an attempt to disrupt that. Mm -hmm. But before May 15, we could even analyze and understand what the implications of May 15, June 4 happened, which was another military, but we tended to support June 4 because we thought it, there was something radical Did about the students it. demand something like June 4th? No, even though it was did. predominated no, by... No, we never did. Were you explained to what June 4th was about? We never knew what June Were 4th was about. Were student leaders asked to be actively involved in the quest for June 4th? No. On the day itself... Yeah. On the day itself... Mm -hmm. When, when there was still fighting going on between the other ranks and the officers yeah. around Nima, some soldiers came to campus and asked, Legon asked, campus. Yes, okay. and asked us to go to town to demonstrate in support of the coup. Okay. Now, as student leaders, we rejected it. We said, no, we couldn't. You opposed it? We opposed it because we said we didn't know who was fighting who and we didn't want to put student lives in danger. 
Because it was it, it meant that we we're going to go in the middle of okay. a firefight between uh -huh. these two groups. Between two military groups. Two military groups, and we refused. So we never really supported it until after uh, the, the the uprising had been successful. That was when we mobilized and visited. Uh, we tried to visit Ghana Barracks to pledge our support for the AFRC. But we didn't get to Ghana Barracks. We ended up at uh, Elmwork Stadium. OK, so it was after June 4th yeah. that you were interested in what was going to happen. Yes. Were our students at the time interested in, in the support of the June 4th movement? Come again. What got students interested in supporting the June 4th uprising at the time? Well, Achim, well not at Chamfon this time, but yeah. the Akufu regime had been removed mm -hmm. from office. And we thought, OK, anything that would stabilize the country. And we thought June 4th was going to do that. Unfortunately, I think that June 4th proved to be the opposite of what we had expected. But at the time, there was no way you could have known it was going to be no, problematic. No, there was no way anyone could have known it was, that was going to be problematic. And I think June 4 has certain individuals within it. The mm -hmm. AFRC has certain individuals within it who convinced us that, look, something positive could come out of it. And who I, are these people? I think someone like Wachijan was very instrumental. Wachijan in, convinced you that there was something good I that think, could come I out of it? I think he did, yes. Because he was kind of... Uh, Not for I thought he was the figurehead of what the actual picture of the new leadership of the country was supposed to be. He was a figurehead of what the, what the AFRC was meant to be. Mm -hmm. But in terms of our, our, the links between the student movement and the AFRC, it was Bajijan we trusted. Why? But he used to come to, he used to, come to campus a lot. Oh, okay, of course. He used to come to campus a lot, even before the coup. Mm -hmm. And then also I think that because of his, let's call it his leg on links, okay. we, tended to, we tended to trust him a lot. So he was able to convince us that, look, something positive was going to come out of this thing. But it did not take long for us to realize that it was just another military government. It was not going to lead to anything. It but was not going to amount to much. But to be fair, the yeah. AFRC itself was just three months. Yes, that's another problem, mm -hmm. which, is, which, which brings us then to December 31st. But after the AFRC handed over, that's when some of us decided that, look, the country required some kind of radical political organization. You, the student grouping, have been tagged as the ones that demanded and called for the blood to flow. And that on campus at Legon and other places, you had demonstrated and demanded on the then Air Force leadership and those from June 4th that to show they are really serious about bringing change, they needed to let the blood flow. I.e., you supported the execution of the generals the mass violations and atrocities that are committed at the time? No, I think that has always been a mistake. I don't know who started this thing, but it has always been a mistake. You cannot blame the student movement for the kind of bloodshed and the kind of torture, the human rights abuses of that period. Now, this business of let the no. blood flow... Did the students support it? No. Did the students we, demand it? Uh, some did. Someday. So you can't really excuse well, students in this yeah, case. It was not, it was, the student movement, as a movement, was, was, the was, National was Union of Ghana Student... Was it a popular student, call? It was not a popular call. Do, this what I'm trying did to Ghanaians say. make the demand that we wanted this to happen? I, I don't know who Ghanaians would have made such a demand. If there was a demand for bloodshed, mm -hmm. it would have been within the military. So tell now, me the story the properly. Movement, okay, when the you met Rollins, what happened? When we met Rollins... Mm -hmm. Basically, we were saying to Rollins, this is the time, well, the student leader uh, at the time, the mm -hmm. president of the national, of the Students Representative Council of the time, mm -hmm. said to him very clearly, if you, if you prosecute this revolution in the interest of Ghana, we will support you. If you betray Ghanaians again, like, you, like other leaders have done in this country, we will resist you. And then Rollins came out and said, no, he was not going to betray the people of Ghana. There was going to be a revolution. There will be a fight against Kalabule. In those days, mm -hmm. corruption was called Kalabule. And that was the, the main center of the debate. Okay. Now, when we finished at Elwak Stadium and we were going back to campus, that was when a small group of students started chanting, let the blood flow. I don't think they could have been more than 15. And all of a sudden, people started saying, students say, let the blood flow. But it wasn't, the student movement never actually took a decision to say, look, we want you to execute anybody. We wouldn't even have known who to execute or whose name to give up. So when people say there was a list, if there was a list, it must have been in the military. Within the student movement, I don't think we had any such list. We don't even know them. How could we have given up a list? All the, in fact, all the only people we knew were Champon and his main you know, operators. Were they corrupt? You mean the general? 
Yes. Achamu pers pers personally, from what I later mm -hmm. on realized, I was on the AFRC confiscated committee. Brilliant. Which meant we went around the country looking at the properties of the AFRC leadership. Mm -hmm. No, no, not AFRC, sorry. Supreme Military Council leadership. The SMC then. SMC Is then. it one or two or both? Both. Okay, yes. Because they had been overthrown. So actually, from my champion straight the to the Akufu yes. period. The AFRC set up a, uh, what do you call it, a confiscated assets committee mm -hmm. comprising military officers, students, and I was one of the student representatives, and others. We went around the country looking at properties. I was surprised to find that Achambo had no property at all. He had a local Bangalore in Kumasi. Compared to his colleagues in Accra who had massive buildings, some of them we didn't, we didn't even know what to do with. So the claim that Achambo was corrupt cannot be true? No, it cannot be true. Personally, no. I wouldn't buy it. Achambo was not corrupt. Is it possible you couldn't have seen some of the properties because of how it's possible. he put it's in possible. different names? But it's possible. But it's also that we had a long, they prepared a long list. I think the military was thorough in preparing the list of mm -hmm. properties. Okay. So if he had hidden any properties, I'm sure they would, have, they would have known. But what I'm basically saying is, the regime itself was corrupt. But as an individual, I doubt if Achempo could have been called corrupt. I mean, compared to what is going on in the country today, Achempo was, was a kid. Really? Yes. Achempo, I think, was a... Well, well Achempo... The regime was, was corrupt, definitely. How do you say so? What was well, happening? What was happening? Basically, I think the economy was going down. Yeah, lots of military, down for so many yeah, reasons, do, yeah. lots of military rulers were busy doing what is happening today. I mean, what is happening today is a continuation. Building huge mansions, buying properties abroad, you know, doing the kind of things that people didn't expect them to do. Were they indeed doing so? From what we saw, Since yes. you later on became part of the confiscation committee, yeah. the people, the leaders, the military leaders that were shot, were any of them corrupt? We never went as far. We never saw properties belonging to Colonel Feli, for instance. Never? Never. We didn't see any. And he was, his name was not even on the list. Mm. The only person who, who had property was probably... Was it, I can't remember the names, but... Kote... Kote. Kote. I think he was an Air Force. I don't know okay. whether he was Air Force or Army. But he had a few, one or two properties, and so on and so forth. Most of those who were corrupt and mm -hmm. had properties were civilians linked to the military. That's the funny thing about all this. Okay, sorry. So I mean, you mean that military leaders themselves were not? Well, I don't think that. They were, they were, they were doing what? In those days, even if you took a $5,000 loan, mm -hmm. that was big news. Okay. Which is what some of them were prosecuted for. I see. Five thousand dollars. That was big news because those days five thousand dollars meant a lot. Mm -hmm. So, so some of them did that, but most you find out that most of the civil servants, the the, the civilians who were around the Champo, took advantage of whatever was going on and then ruined themselves. So there was a lot of corruption in the country. There's no doubt about that, and I think that's what Ghanaians wanted to be corrected. But whether to correct it through bloodshed or the sort we saw or not, I cannot. Was say. there popular support? for Joe Rollins to come in no. after May 15th? No. There was no popular support for the continuation of the military in any form. But once June 4 happened, there was popular support for after it. After it happened? After it happened. But they, were, they did not call for it? No. Because basically nobody knew Jerry Rollins. We didn't know where he stood for, we didn't know where he came from, and so on. And we have spent years fighting for a return to civilian rule. And we got it. Okay. Or we're about to get it. Mm, so because there was election planned. There was election planned. I so see. most of us saw it as an interruption of what the civilian, what, what of the efforts that we had put into this thing. So there was no call for another military intervention. But once it happened, and, what, and because of the promises that were made by Jerry Rollins and the AFRC, I think people gradually began to accept them. The NRC and other records indicates that the period, the three months period of June 4th, the AFRC period, yeah. were some of the, perhaps the periods that we had the highest number of violations of people's human rights and all the other things. Was this true? This is something we later found out. You later found out? We later found out. Because most of these violations, mm -hmm. you see, in the military regime, everything that is done is done by the military. Okay. So these violations took place within the barracks mm -hmm. and sometimes in the markets. 
Mm -hmm. So sometimes stories abound as to how market women were treated and so on and so forth. But these were things that we, we later on discovered. None, most of us did not know these things were going on. At the time that were at happening. At the time that they were happening. Which is, which is, which is the problem with military regimes. Okay. Because military, most things happen within the barracks. Mm. You are arrested, you are taken to the barracks, you are whipped, you are tortured, and that is it. So outside, nobody really gets to know outside, about it. Outside, nobody really gets to know about it, except at uh, maybe checkpoints where the police also do their own thing, where people are roughed up and so on, or the soldiers who are stationed outside Accra also tended to, to have their own rules of engagement, in terms of torture, arresting people, and so on and so forth. But most of us did not know that these things were going on. And the student movement would have condemned it if we had known. There was a rift between Bwachijan and President Rawlings. Mm -hmm. Why did that happen? Why? Yes. It's a very strange thing because we did not know that this was going to happen until, until after they had handed over. Okay. Until the AFRC handed over. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll tell you something else. When the AFRC handed over, two movements emerged in the country. Actually, there were three. You had the June 4 movement, mm -hmm. which was basically, which was later on supported by Rawlings. And then you had a movement on national affairs, led by Kweku Bako, which mm -hmm. was also supported by Boatijan. And I then, see. of course, you had another, another group called the New Democratic Movement. So who was leading the June 4 movement? The June 4 movement initially was led by a gentleman called Kosiedu. Yeah, okay, because and myself and others okay. who were the founders of the you are part of the those of Rollins' side, yes. I see. Well, at that time, Rollins was not a member, oh, okay. Eventually, he you joined, said he became the support, he, eventually, of the he came to support us, okay, and he joined our movement. But that was the, the, the June 4 movement. But the main aim of the June 4 movement was basically to try and let's say conscientize Ghanaians on some of the aims of the June 4 uprising and to say, Look, things could have been done better. Can we now do? Can we now have a proper revolution of of of, of a proper civilian uprising to change the system to end Kalabule and that kind of thing? But what these two, uh, Boatijan, the entry of Boatijan and Jerry into these two groups spoiled everything. Really? When I say spoiled everything, we meant that the conflict that they had was imported into was imported into these two groups. But was the source of the conflict known? No, many of, us, them. many of us did not know the source of the conflict. There were different stories. You know, the Bwachijan side would say, for instance, that uh, Jerry Rollins was A, B, C, D, right? Mm -hmm. And then... So A, B, C, D being what? Well, I don't want to mention specifics. Oh, okay. That's yeah, what because I mean. you only said A, B, C, D. <laughs> so <laughs> so for instance, that Rollins was like this, or he was like that when he was, when he was, he, when he was much younger. Mm -hmm. He was such a person and that kind of thing. And then the, what do you call it, the Rollins side, uh, the Washington, and then the Rollins, Rollins used to tell us how Washington had been such a coward and he ran away on the day of June 4 and so on and so forth. But they were all, they were caught in their support for the Lehman administration. And I think Washington was more in favor of the Lehman administration, which meant that those of us who were also, who had doubts about the ability of the Lehman administration to hold the country together, tended to support. To Some of you had doubts about that. Yeah. About the ability of the Lehman regime to hold the country together. How so? He was popularly elected. Yeah, he was popularly elected. But if you were, if you were in Ghana in those days, the problems that the Achampo regime faced, going down to the Akufu period and subsequently the AFRC, had not been resolved in any way. Now, problems beyond corruption being what? Economy. The economy? The economy. Yeah, but don't turn around economists in a year. Well, Yes, or two. but you need to see signs. Really? You may in not be able to turn around in two years. No, of course you can't. Yes. It is, it's unrealistic. Yeah. That's when people say, why haven't you done anything in the last, you know, we voted for you and you promised ABC that you haven't done. Okay. You can't turn around an economy in two years. I, I get you. But I think that basically, to be fair to the Lehman government, mm -hmm. there was such a rush. Because okay. I think that there were some people in the AFRC, particularly Rawlings, who felt that handing over was a mistake. Really? Yes. And that is the impression, and that's why, and that they even carried that into the June 4 movement. Mm -hmm. So we had lengthy arguments about the, 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 the 31st December coup as to whether we should be part of it or not. But basically, this, the conflict between Boachijan and Rawlings was imported into these two groups, and the issues were never resolved until December 31st, and they have never been resolved. Was December 31st expected? No, not many. Well. Personally, it was expected because I knew it was being planned. Okay. 
Because the June 4 movement, not, not the whole group, but some individuals within the June 4 movement had been contacted and told okay. that this could happen. Mm. And were asked to lend our support. Half of us said no. We're not part of the we're not we're not going to get involved in the overthrow really? of a constitutional government. Yes, of a constitutional You're government. You're one of those who said that. Uh, I will not tell you who said I was. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I want to be clear. Were you one of those who said that they should remove the administration? You're was not ambivalent. clear in your mind. I was not clear in my mind. But basically I support the removal of Lima. You supported rem supported Lima's Lima. removal? Yeah, I did. Okay. Yeah, I did. But then and then, of course, there were those who, who said no, they couldn't be part of it. But once the, once the, the whole thing happened, once the coup took place, the UFO movement was forced to support it. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. And uh, so the, everybody now came around. How to about the, other, the opposing group, the one that Boachijan supported? Uh, were they in support or opposed? No, way? they were opposed. And there was actually a feeling that they were working with Boachijan to reverse the coup. Okay, now let me ask you this question because it's important. Yeah. Now, the people I've spoken to from Bwachijan through to Bar and for and all of those, they feel a sense of betrayal because of the 31st December coup. They said June 4th was supposed to be the coup that ended all coups in the country. That would be the final military intervention of any sort. Was that the feeling? That was the feeling. At the time before they handed over. We used to hear stories that, listen, let June 4 be the last, let June 4 be the defining moment of all coups. And that is why some people felt that December 31st was such a big betrayal and should never have happened. For that reason, also for the reason that Liman had not actually had the time to settle into... Yes, about two years. About two years. He, so he had not really... In fact, the coup, as far as I know, the, the, the coup to remove Liman started immediately after the handover. The planning mm -hmm. started immediately after the handover. It did not take long for people to come to me and say, look, this thing is being planned. We need your help to do A, B, C, D. And of course, in my youthful enthusiasm and so on, I, I, I just bought into it. So that, that was another. On, on hindsight, no, uh, uh, from hindsight, when you look at things from the post facto rationalization position now, was it worth it? It wasn't worth it at all. It was unnecessary, to be honest. Really? It was unnecessary in the sense that there was no particular agreement as to where we're going to how we're going to execute this revolution. Mm -hmm. So while some of us were busy forming people's defense committees and thinking that that was the, the way out of getting the masses involved in democratic governance, mm -hmm. at the district level, at, in the barracks, in the police station, and so on and so forth, there were those who had just come to continue from where... The, uh, the politicians and the previous regimes left off in terms of corruption. So oh, I see. Yeah, the corruption that we are seeing now did not begin. If I started on December thirty first, but you see, at that time the defense committees and the ordinary soldiers were so anti-corruption that no one could openly involve him, his or herself in corruption without consequences. So we're able to bring corruption down to almost zero, but it didn't last. Because the system, the system is so entrenched that it doesn't matter what you do. This is as far back as 81. I'm talking about 81. Yes. The system was so entrenched that you see that there was no way Liman could have prevented what was going on because we accused the Liman government of corruption. They too. They too. They were I also see. accused of corruption. <laughs> and then, so you see... The, the two-year government. The two-year government. I see. People said he did nothing and there were all kinds of... And I think it was the nature of the... Was Liman ever found to be... Was he ever proven to uh, in a court of competent jurisdiction to have been engaged in corruption? No, I don't think he was ever put on trial for that. Yeah, he was. But he could not have been found. I don't think he was that. Okay. He was not such an acquisitionist, if I yeah. may. Yeah, I mean, he, he was not grabbing way. wealth. No, he wasn't in the. He, some of the people around him in the PNP government okay. were grabbing. Okay. I don't think he himself was in the in the process of grabbing. Okay. So you could not have he, he could not have been found to be that corrupt. So. That first happened. Yes. Was it a very violent uprising? 31st was quite violent. Mm. Apart from, I think the, the, the most violent in our country would have been the 1966 school. Okay. Because of the resistance that yeah, the was presented. officers Gats, put up. Yeah. The, the, the presidential guards, you know, the resistance they put up. Okay. You know. But 31st was violent in the sense that there was also resistance. Mm -hmm. Right. But... 
with the help of people like Sergeant Takatapori, mm -hmm. who was able to mobilize a lot of Nordic soldiers. Mind you, see, this is where the, the tribalism comes in. Lima was a Nordner. Okay, that's interesting. Lima was a Nordner. Yeah, that's true. So any group attempting to remove Liman, which did not have a sizable Northern component, would have been problematic. Oh, I get the point. Yeah. Y you get the point. Mm -hmm. So Akataporo was very central to the removal of Liman. And it was violent because the, the, the military intelligence then, I don't know what they are called these days, but the military intelligence then, plus the national security of Hila Liman, were very active. And mm -hmm. they were willing to put up a resistance to the coup. Two, the, the senior officers who had also seen June 4 were not prepared for a repeat of what had happened. Of what had happened. And I think some of them expressed reservations and got themselves shot. So the, it was quite violent. But these were incidents that took place within the military. Right? Okay, not within outside. The military. Not outside. A lot of the people who were shot initially were mostly senior officers. So there was, yeah, there was violent resistance. There was violent, and if you talk to some of the, those who were actually involved, okay. People like Akatapori and uh, his, 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 what we normally, we normally refer to as his boys, mm -hmm. fought very hard to, 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 to end the resistance from the military. Oh, I see. Yes. So he was actually the key to the success of 31st December. I think he was key. Mm. He was key. He was key because he also had links to, to the national security that was keeping in him place at the time. Yeah. In place at the time. Now, you could not have executed a coup without knowing what the other side was thinking. Oh, okay. And he was very central to it. Okay. Now, let me get this point also clarified. So, now, real governance had to happen and the real revolution had to start. Yeah. Were you immediately given the position? No. You see, the June 4 movement mm -hmm. had already started building up Committees. They were then just known. They were not committees of the revolution, but they were called June Four committees okay. across the country. So, and they were most active in in Accra, in Ashanti region, in Eastern region, in Northern, in fact, in the, in the upper region. Okay. So once the coup occurred, there was that feeling that oh, this was most of the members of the June Four movement thought this was their thing, even though many of us did not see it as such. Mm -hmm. So they they just got they they, they just got, got on board. They got on board and mobilized for the revolution. And that's why we were able to set up the People's and Workers' Defense Committees within such a short time. And that was the people, I mean, personally, I was, I was in the upper region, running a radio station at the time. <laughs> and uh, it happened. And then we were, I was invited to Accra and for an interview, basically, which didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Because once I got to Accra, I was told that oh, I was already known, so there was no need for an interview. And that was it. That's why I became the secretary I for became the secretary. Youth because the youth, youth was a very important ministry to us. It was very important for us to get the youth on board. Mm -hmm. And they needed somebody who understood mobilization of the youth and how to get the youth contained, basically. And, and that is how it all happened. The issue of confiscations, they were also dominant under the PND period. Yeah. Why? I think there was some confusion about wealth and its acquisition. Okay. You see how Ghana is today? Yes. You hear stories about the managing director of Joy AFM has built so many houses. Yes. We don't have proof that he has actually built so many houses, but everybody says it. Mm -hmm. So those kind of things got to the situation where people were saying, some were saying, Oh, nobody should have two houses, but we don't. Uh, we never really asked how those two houses were acquired. Okay. Whether they were acquired through your, let's say, somebody goes to study in the United States, comes back with his own money and he builds houses and he buys cars. We tended to confuse that with people who are taking advantage of their their, their position in the country's oh okay structure. So to build their wealth own houses through corruption and legitimate wealth was not really separated. It was not separated. And so when, and two, those who, who were put in charge of, the, of uh, what do you call it, confiscated assets in those days, and the public tribunals, were not from the June 4 movement. Let's face it, they were not. No member of the June 4 movement was involved in those committees. Mm. Yeah. Because once, once Wh it Where are they from? They were mostly appointed by Rollins and, and his group. Okay. Yeah. So now, we were not involved in those things, even though 
People who were outside the government thought that, oh, this was being done by the socialists and so and we were not involved yeah. in it at all. Okay. Now, when we come back, yeah. the events leading to the abduction and the claim of the judges, you were in government at the time. Yes. Yes, you were in government at the time. Yes. When we come back, we'll talk about that. Well, folks, my guest is still Zaya Yebo. He's, he was the PNDC's Youth and Sports Secretary, the very first one. After the break, we'll continue our conversation. You welcome back. This is Upfront. My name is Raymond Alqua. So tomorrow, as at 8 p.m., you have the final opportunity of watching that all-important historical account and also questioning the history that we've been putting out there over the period and asking the main questions about whether we are truly reconciled as a state. It's titled Scars of the Revolution. And you see the ad running on your screen there. It's, it's one important uh, what they call it, documentary that you cannot miss at all. The, perhaps the biggest of our special assignments so far. And that will be coming up tomorrow at 8 p.m. Ahead of that, though, the man I'm having here with me lived through the revolutionary period. In fact, he was a government official at the revolutionary period. He was not just a government official. Today, he would have been called a minister, mm -hmm. if he were to be in those days. And Zayaebo was actually the secretary for youth and sports. He's been in Ezra for a long time and has been working <laughs> <laughs> since he had that position. Now, we tip it off for talking about, and I said we we're going to talk about the assassination of the three high court judges and a retired army officer. Okay, so folks, if you see me referencing something, he has a book. The book is titled The Struggle for Popular Power, Rolling Savior or Demagogue. And, and this actually is, 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 yes, this is the book. He encapsulates his time in office and the things that happened at the time. You were in office when the assassination of the high court judge ha happened, right? Yes. With Major Sam Alqua. Yeah. I am, I, there's a point you made in your book about, you said, this is one episode which Rawlings had wanted to exploit in his efforts to crush the revolutionary and progressive grouping within the PNDC. Why do you say so? You see, prior to the assassination of the judges mm -hmm. and the retired army officer, there was already a crisis within the revolution. The cracks had already begun. Cracks, cracks within, the revolution. within the revolution. Political cracks. Okay. Yeah. There were serious disagreements because we're having the serious daily disagreements about the state of the economy. When some faction of the government said we should go back to the IMF and the World Bank, mostly the IMF, and some of us said no, we needed our own homegrown. Let's go back to seven-year development plan of Kwame Nkrumah. Let's go to the, the plan that Achampong had. Mm -hmm. Let us look towards home and forget about all this. IMF. So that was the main rift. That was it was main, about was economic the, policy and direction. Yes. But okay. the second one was also about leadership and political ambitions. Which Why uh, people wanted to replace Rollins as the chairman of the PNDC? No, I think it was more people wanting to gain access to the chairman. Oh, I see. You see, it was, mm -hmm. replacing him was, was going to be difficult. Okay. Two, mainly because he was very popular. I mean, whatever we might say, he was very mm -hmm. popular. Mm -hmm. And you could not replace him unless you are somebody as popular as he was. Okay. So that was problematic. I see. But I think there was a scramble within the PNDC for access to Rollins. It was like, who will gain access to Rollins? So we're already in crisis. And then that was when the, uh, what we normally call the right wing, but okay, the, the, the faction that we now know as the Buzia Dankwa okay. became very active. Against oh. the revolution. Oh, I see. They were they also were, active. Oh, they were very active. And they had always been <laughs> against the revolution. Mm -hmm. And how to handle them was a big issue. And of course, we didn't know how to handle them. Because short of shooting people left, right, and center, mm -hmm. it wasn't easy. So the revolution was already facing serious problems. Now, I believe that there was a need for Rollins to find a way, a very easy way of getting rid of us without Ghanaians asking any question at all. And how was that possible? Well, subsequently, when the judges were made, there were attempts to pin the murder on us. You know, it's funny, huh? I lived next door to the lady who was murdered, the, the honorable judge who was murdered. But I didn't know she lived there. I lived next door to her. Oh, I see. 
But I didn't know because, I mean, whom did I know in Accra? <laughs> I didn't know any big shot. Mm. Okay. It, I only got to know after, she, after the incident. Because people used to come and stand in front of my house and look at the house very strangely. And there were rumors all over the place that we were involved in the murder of the judges. When we had no clue. The poor in your house? Or you? No. People like me around, members of the June 4 movement in the government. Ah, uh, okay, I see. So apart from Alolga, I was mentioned. Other colleagues were also mentioned. And I had no clue what this was all about. So it was obvious that somebody was trying to pin this thing on us. Fortunately, the minister for, the secretary for interior was mm -hmm. Johnny Hanson. Yeah. But Johnny Hanson was very close to us, was close to the June 4 movement. Mm -hmm. And I regarded him more as a mentor. So Johnny Hanson would call us and tell us what was being said. So it was obvious that somebody within either Rollins or Kojo Chikata were trying to pin this thing on us. You don't know that for a fact? No, I don't have proof. But it was all from the way things were going, they were trying to pin it on somebody. Eventually, they ended up shooting Amate Kwe for it. Now, when you say they ended up shooting Amate Kwe, you, you make it sound <laughs> like it's not plausible that he was the brain behind it. No, Amate Kwe could never have been the brain behind it. How so? First, it was a military operation. Mm -hmm. Amate Kwe was not a soldier. If you understood the structure of the, of the PNDC at the time, Soldiers took their instructions from the barracks okay. and from fellow soldiers. So it is no matter who you were, whether you were a PNDC secretary or you were a member of the, PND, or the PNDC itself, you could not give instructions to soldiers to do that kind of thing. So the idea that Amate Kwe could have given instructions to four soldiers to go and carry out that operation was something that still doesn't sit well with me at all. I don't think he could have done that. So it had to be, the, the orders had to come from somebody very high. Because mind you, you are not talking about some poor workers or even poor soldiers. Okay. You are talking of judges. Yeah. Now, these were, these were the cream of society. Now, who could have given instructions for the Amada? Amatekwe couldn't have. What power did Amatekwe have as even a member of the PNDC? He didn't. So it had to be somebody very high up in the government to issue those instructions. You don't know who it is? No, I don't know who it is. But you are you're a minister. You are, you're, you're, you're basically a minister. <laughs> you're not a cabinet minister, were you? I was a cabinet minister. Yes, I was a cabinet minister who will not know where, when instructions come from for such acts of state to... Those days, Yes, there was such a serious... That's, that's what I'm trying to explain. Said, so that was part of the rift period? And that was part of the okay. rift. Mm -hmm. So it was... Uh, this thing was never discussed at the cabinet level. Never? Even after the murders. So who do you suspect was behind it? Whom do I suspect? Yeah. If I have to mention anybody, I will suspect Rollins. Really? Yes. What would be your basis for making that claim? My basis is that the whole thing was reckless. Reckless? Yes. <laughs> Why would you go and catch no, four sorry, people? So, 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 but <laughs> the fact that it was reckless, it's not justification that he's the one behind it. Well, who else would have been so reckless within the PNDC? I don't understand what you're saying. What I'm trying to say, the operation itself... Mm -hmm. Have to be done by somebody who was in a hurry to do something, who was desperate enough to want this to want to set up other people to take the fall for something that they knew Ghanaians would, would hate. Oh, okay, Ghanaians hated it, and the whole country was basically shut down because of that. Nobody liked it. Now, who, two, there were also stories in those days about some of the the events leading to the abduction itself. For instance, and I've, I've documented that in my book. For instance, it is said that the car leading to uh, the keys for one of the cars. For the trooper. For the trooper was left in his house for the soldiers to pick up. Mm -hmm. Now, if those keys were, had, had been left in my house, would they have seen it as purely accidental? No. It had to, they had to know, too. But he was never asked this question. No, nobody has. There has been no, what do you call it, uh, serious investigation. Up to today, he was Up never to asked today. this question. No, he has never been asked because there has been no serious investigation. Two, there were rumors after the whole thing that after the incident, that was before they realized that Ghanaians were opposed to it, some people popped champagne in his house. Rumors? Yes, there were rumors. I mean, you cannot just. No, no, I can't. That's why I say there are rumors. There were rumors. Yes. So obviously, when you look, look at all these incidents and what happened, 
And then subsequently, they attempt to frame up a logger out for it. Now, why do you go, why do people of a certain ethnic group, right, mm -hmm. who are not nerdness, those days, these days, every, everybody wears fugu. Yeah. Those days, it was not very common to wear fugu. And if you wore a fugu in Accra, everybody knew you were not. Why would they? Oh, I get it. The people who went to the homes of these, these uh, that, were all wearing were the wearing smoke. Not, yeah. The smoke. Why would they do that? Unless somebody was trying to, to point the whole thing towards nodness. And who are some of the key nodness in the government? And that really frightened us. It was obvious that somebody was trying to pin this whole thing on us. And we're not going to have it. So we condemned it seriously. I mean, the June 4 movement. Mm -hmm. We issued a statement, condemned mm -hmm. it. And we continue issuing statements saying that we're not part of this thing. People believed you? I think they did. You sure? Well, at that time, it was difficult to tell who believed you. That was before social media. So it was difficult to tell. But the point was that none of us could have ordered that kind of thing. Yeah, because this were the cream of society. There's That's something you I mean. write in your book. You said, yeah. for his part, Rawlings feared the Katapori so intensely that he wanted a legitimate reason to eliminate him. Yes. Here was a perfect excuse. Both the ruling class and Rawlings found a congruence of interest. Yeah. Akatapori's claims that he was being framed were true. What he did not realize was that the forces lined up against him were far wider. You also mentioned here that how about the involvement of Kojuti Kata? Throughout the investigations and his subsequent trial, Amatukwe had insisted that the whole affair had been the brainchild of Kojuti Kata, who in turn vehemently but unconvincingly denied it. He didn't believe the denial of um, Kojuti Kata. Most people never did. Most people within the and PNDC. You as people who personally, are... Personally, personally, yeah. my own analysis of it is this. That he was not involved. Okay. But once it happened, mm -hmm. he had to protect them. Oh, okay. Yeah. They had to protect each other because people couldn't tell the difference between the two. People couldn't tell what was it, Jerry, was it Kojo, or was it both. Oh, okay. So they had to protect each other. But I, if you were to ask me, I would know, I would bet on Jerry as having a hand in it. There's an incident I was talking about, about the second and the fourth of um, the July incidents. Yeah. When the former President Rollins had addressed a group in outside and said it was forces that were opposed to the revolution that actually conducted themselves this way. Yeah. You see, he kept on giving... He said forces. Now, if you wanted forces that were opposed to the revolution, then you were talking about the right wing in Ghana at the time. Yes. The Buzia Dankogo. They, they were the most organized right wing force opposed, to, opposed the, to the revolution. But they could not have killed the, <laughs> their own kind. Right? Yeah. Now, so the next thing, the next thing was for him to say the so-called, um, what do they used to call us? Radicals in the revolution mm -hmm. were responsible. This is what he, what he was aiming for. To say the radicals in the revolution wanted to speed up the revolution and went and murdered these four people. That, that was just, that was not possible. None of us was a soldier. None of us could have given instructions to America and the rest to go around the Accra picking up people who would not even know existed. And this is what I'm saying. Now, my last question to you is about, you spent some time in your book talking about atrocities and uh, you call it dictatorship system and the suppression of human rights. <laughs> are you talking still the government that you are part of? Yes. There was dictatorship and suppression of human rights? No. By 1980, by the middle of, by the early 1983, yes. most of us had left. Oh, I see. Interesting. Yeah, most of us had left. So you only and saw dictatorship had, after you left? Yeah, well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Not only that I saw dictatorship, but a lot of the... the, 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 the the, the, the period, the human rights abuses, were aimed at those who were opposed to the IMF. We had left, mm -hmm. but there were still many forces within the country, especially the, the workers and the trade unions, okay. who were opposed to the IMF program. Oh, okay. And they were now being targeted. Oh, so that was the reason? That was, yeah. Were, were, were they demonstrating? Some were demonstrating. Okay. Some were trying to mobilize the workers. Were they making the state ungovernable? They did not, got, they did not get that far. Okay. Even though... If they had been allowed, they would have made the state ungovernable. Okay. And that's when Rollins really became vicious. So okay. a lot of the viciousness happened from 1983 onwards. A lot of innocent people were arrested, incarcerated, for reasons that nobody knows. And some were shot. And that's what I call the abuse of rights. You know of some rights. of them personally? 
I know, oh, I know, especially after June 19th, mm -hmm. a lot of the young soldiers who were... The jailbreak? The jailbreak. Okay. A lot of the soldiers who were shot, I knew some of them because we had worked together. Um, but before then, before then, if you, if you, uh, what, if you were opposed to the PNDC for any reason, you were bound to be arrested. And that is what then led to the era of silence because it got to the point where people were so scared they wouldn't even talk. And I remember even in London, there were times when the BBC would be looking for people to interview on the situation in Ghana, and nobody would go, even though we were in exile. Oh, but you were away from the state. Yes, they were so you, scared. You feared when you were outside well, the state. Well, not me. And that's how I became <laughs> popular. I used to appear on BBC popularly okay. because everybody has refused. They refused because they were too scared of the consequences on their families back in Ghana. And that was the era of silence. So a lot of soldiers, a lot of uh, trade unionists, were handed the area into exile or were shot and some were tortured. And I think a lot of it came up during the, what do you call it? The, the National Reconciliation, National Reconciliation. Exercise. Yeah. Now, in the sum, when you look back of the revolutionary period, did they achieve its aim? <laughs> First, we must have had an aim. The aim was to read the system of corruption. The aim was to read the system of corruption. Give it, no, we didn't. Give, give, give it true democracy no, not necessarily but give it true development no we didn't probity accountability we we were we, we scored nil on all those really we scored nil yeah because look at the, the, the level of corruption in this country today the level of corruption and who complains more about corruption in this country but Rollins himself which means that he knows that he did not achieve when it comes to that particular bit of the revolution he did not was it worth it no, we could have done we could have done what we did through the democratic means. We could have formed the party, which is one of the things we discussed. We could have formed the party as a uniform movement, and we could have done the same thing. It wasn't worth it because, especially the number of lives lost, mm -hmm. the number of young soldiers who were killed, the number of workers who were imprisoned, it wasn't worth it at all. I don't think that any nation should go through that again. I'm told my time is up, but you are one person that I will engage consistently because there's a lot that to I have to explore with you. Zaya, thank you so much for joining us here in the studios here thank today. You. Do they still call you comrade? Or you have, since you spent a long time in London, you have abandoned the uh, socialist tendencies? No, 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 I'm still comrade. Okay, well, thank okay. you so much. And uh, <laughs> Zaya Bo is a former PNDC Secretary for Youth and Sports. He joined us to give us a brighter appreciation of the periods that he was in government. Folks, that's where we end today's edition of Upfront. Many thanks to you for joining us.